and they went and entered into a village of the Samaritans to make ready for him. And they did not receive him because his face was as though he would go to Jerusalem. And when his disciples, James and John, saw this, they said, Lord, would thou that we command fire to come down from heaven and consume them, even as Elias did? But he turned and rebuked them and said, Ye know not what manner of spirit ye are of. For the Son of Man is not come to destroy men's lives, but to save them. And they went to another village. And it came to pass that as they went in the way, a certain man said unto him, Lord, I will follow thee whithersoever thou goest. And Jesus said unto him, Foxes have holes, and birds of the air have nests. But the Son of Man hath nowhere to lay his head. And he said unto another, Follow me. But he said, Lord, suffer me first to go and bury my father. Uh -huh. Jesus said unto him, Let the dead bury the dead. But go, th go thou and preach the kingdom of God. And another also said, Lord, I will follow thee. But let me first go. Bid them farewell, which are at home at my house. And Jesus said unto him, No man having put his hand to the plow, and looking back, is fit for the kingdom of God. I want you to notice in this passage of scripture, Jesus said in the 57th through the 62nd verse of Luke chapter 9 to three different men, follow me. Follow me. And I like to talk from the subject, being a disciple of Christ calls for costly commitment. Amen. Being a disciple of Christ calls for costly commitment. Because as Christians, we no longer belong to ourselves, but to our Lord. <laughs> for whom we are called to suffer. Amen. And obviously from our text, you should see the one thing that Jesus wants most from us is total dedication. Amen. Not our half-hearted service Amen. or half-hearted commitment, but our total dedication Amen. to Jesus Christ. But it's unfortunate that most people selectively pick and choose among Jesus' ideas and commands that which they will trust and obey. Our Luke chapter 9 teach us that we have to accept the cross along with the crown. Amen. And we have to accept judgment along with mercy. Well. Because nothing or no one should be placed above a total commitment to living for Jesus. You ought to see in this text that Jesus will not accept being second to none. Amen. In fact, he demands your complete loyalty to him. Amen. Despite the difficulty you may find yourself in. So put him first. Well, or be consistent in your loyalty towards him in all areas uh -huh. of your life. Not just in your church attendance church participation, church praise and worship, but show your loyalty to God in your giving and reverence of him out of a sincere heart too. Because when we reverence God with our whole heart, then our work, our relationships, our use of money, our use of our time, talent, and treasures will be in keeping with God's good and perfect will. Uh -huh. So let this message be an encouragement to you if you, are try, if you are rather toying with the decision to follow Jesus or not to follow him, especially if you don't know what to do. Uh -huh. Take note of the three men in Luke chapter 9 uh -huh. as Jesus was getting ready to cross to the other side. In other words, Jesus was on his way to Jerusalem uh -huh. to die on the cross for the sins of the world. 
And you are to take note of the three men who approached him because the first man was a scribe who oddly enough in a moment of enthusiasm and impulse uh -huh. declared his willingness to follow Jesus wherever he went well. according to Matthew 8 and 19. And the second man was a would-be rash disciple overcome by procrastination, entangled in the affairs of the world. And his delays seemed almost reasonable, but apparently his thoughts and words were not enough to follow Jesus. Amen. And the last man wanted a furlough to bid his loved ones goodbye. In other words, his problem, like many, was he couldn't see the importance of God's work. Right. And he also felt his own work was more urgent than God's. Uh -huh. But little did he know that effective disciples cannot be double-minded right. because they're not up to the task. Well. So think on these three men. As I talk about being a disciple of Christ calls for costly commitment. Uh -huh. I want you to think on these three men because our lives and our deeds uh -huh. reveal whether we are truly thankful and loyal to God for his goodness toward us. Well. That's why Jesus demands that we put him first instead of those things that fade away, things that can be stolen, things that can be lost, things that eventually were out, things that will not last, uh -huh. and things that will ultimately be used up. You should put Jesus first because he paid the price of our redemption with his own shed blood. Amen. In fact, John uh -huh. and James recognized great Christ's great love for us and man's hatred for God. Uh -huh. And they wanted Jesus to destroy those who rejected him. But Jesus said, the son of man is not come to destroy men's <clears throat> lives, but to save them. Uh -huh. And whereby, when approached by the three men that I mentioned a few moments ago, Jesus used this incident in Luke chapter 9 to teach us what it truly means to be a disciple of Christ. Because Jesus was rejected and despised and received not of his own. And though there was room for the foxes and birds which Jesus made, simply there was no room in the, in the heart of men for their creator. Amen. That's why Jesus is never impressed with the size of the crowd. Did y'all get that? Amen. Jesus is never impressed with the size of the crowd, no matter how many follow him. As a matter of fact, usually numbers aren't a problem until the crowd discover that following Jesus calls for sacrifice, commitment, dedication, and service. Then the crowd refused to do so because like the three men of Luke chapter 9, they were hoping to find that coming to Jesus would be like living a life of pie in the sky, which they didn't find. In other words, in Luke chapter 9, in Jesus teaching about the cost of following him, what he made known is Jesus' ministry is not to a favored few who get fat, healthy, wealthy, and wise. Uh -huh. But his ministry, or in other words, his work of salvation, is to those who are distressed, yeah. those who need a savior. Well. Because after Jesus was rejected by his own in verses 51 through 56, who received him not, he gave commandment to depart unto the other country well, or the other side where his word would be received by whosoever would come to him. Following Jesus is a matter of individual faith in the Lord Jesus Christ. 
you ought to see that he gave word to his disciples to depart unto the other side where his word would be received by whosoever would come to him because following <coughs> Jesus is not a corporate matter, but it is an individual matter. It's an individual matter of faith in the Lord Jesus Christ. Next of all, that's why the first man, who is unknown to us by name, his words are recorded in verse 57. And his words are of great importance because Matthew alone with Luke tell us, he said to Jesus, Lord, I will follow thee whithersoever thou goest. And the first man which spoke to Jesus was a scribe. Or by virtue of his religious position, he was normally one of the natural enemies of Jesus Christ. However, he was one of the few of his order in Christ's day that came to believe in him and follow him. But the sad thing that Jesus revealed about this unknown and unnamed scribe is he had only an impulsive, momentary enthusiasm because in testing the reality of his decision to follow Jesus wherever he went or his willingness to give as a sacrifice his all and all to God. Notice Jesus used the first man's request to teach us it is not that Jesus bids men to come unto him. Rather, he would actually have no one to follow him without first counting the costs. Because how many times do men and women wrestle with, should I follow Jesus or should I not? Usually they let their emotions, they allow their circumstances and situations to control them instead of the Holy Spirit. I want you to think about that because the Holy Spirit wants to control each and every one of us. And it is the Holy Spirit. He brings about true conviction and conversion. And like the first man, Christ's message register in their head and they give a response to it with their lips. Yet like the first man, in their heart where it really matters, they have no desire to change, no desire to repent of their sin, and no desire to yield themselves completely to God. So like the first man, as soon as the heat hits the flame, they turn back to the world because all they had was a head faith. However, the, have a true heart faith in God counts the cost of being a true disciple of Christ and does not settle for the increasing popularity of a growing, vital, impressive, visible, successful Christian ministry or what they equate to the popularity of Christ. So they go alone and jump on the bandwagon of religion because they feel this is a good thing or this is a good place to be. But notice how Jesus took advantage of this opportunity to also show how the first man actually represent those revolving door church members who quickly come in and go out before you realize they're gone and never see them again. Because to them, the hype, the attention, the activity, the reward. In other words, the church was just another organization of comfort and convenience. It was just another crowd gathered that benefited their interests. So Jesus used this occasion from the first man's words to let us see people like him are difficult to build a strong, healthy, stable and productive ministry around because of their lack of wholehearted devotion to God. That's why Jesus dealt with the first man upon an uh, emotional appeal because he knew man's emotional response is very shallow at best. 
And that's why neither did the first man's emotional response or the size of the crowd impressed Jesus. I want y'all to get that because some people, why I preach, while the songs are sung, while we pray, while we are gathered in worship, they are brought to tears many times because they hear the words and they see the praise going on and they just feel like something should be happening. Sometimes it's because of guilt. Other times it's because of shame. Even a few times it's because of remorse. And inside the sanctuary, you would think that that person is really changed. That person is really under conviction. But as soon as the benediction is given and they go back home, go back into the world, they turn right back to the very things that they were doing before they entered into the house of the Lord. That's the reason why I want you to know Jesus was not impressed by the first man's emotional response or the size of the crowd, which obviously, by, the way, by way or rather of contrast, the size of the crowd and his emotional response impressed the man, according to verse 57, because he reminds us of those today who come into the church seeking membership only to make a business deal or a love connection or any other worldly gain. Therefore, Jesus turned to him and gave an implied rebuke because he didn't count the cost of the sacrifice and pain of being a disciple of Christ. Jesus gave him this mild rebuke saying, foxes have holes, meaning dens in the ground to live in, and birds of the air have nests, which they have taken from the straw, the leaves, the grass from the ground, and made their homes but because of the sacrifice Jesus Christ has made to pay for our redemption, the Son of Man, which was a title given to Jesus that emphasized his humanity, humility, and exalted role as judge of all nations, the Son of Man hath nowhere to lay his head, showing how low in his incarnation Jesus became for our sake. In other words, he emptied himself not of his deity, uh -huh. but of his rights right. to be served. And oh, what great love, because Jesus humbled himself yeah. to the death of the cross. Amen. Therefore, he urged the first man not to follow me if he thought Jesus was just another way to the Father, because I am the way. Uh -huh. I am the truth, yeah. and I am the life. Yeah. All other ground is seeking sand. Therefore, put Jesus first Amen. in your life Amen. because there is no other way besides him. Yes. This is what Jesus, first of all, wanted him to see. Uh -huh. And he also wanted him to know that he would have no one to make a rash, sudden, and emotional decision well. without first counting the cost of following him. Because being a disciple of Christ calls for costly commitment. In other words, those who sincerely follow Jesus must be prepared to walk his path of lowliness or loneliness and rejection and share in his sorrows. And the sad thing is about the first man, no one really knows whether or not he ever chose to sincerely follow Jesus Amen. all of the way. Uh -huh. All we know is each and every one of us well, will have to make a decision uh -huh. either to follow Jesus or to turn and walk away. Amen. And this is an individual decision that you must make. Uh -huh. Let me ask you personally, what's your decision? I know you're looking at the person uh -huh. nearest you. Or maybe you have someone else in mind as I'm sharing this message with you right now. Uh -huh. But I want to ask you, how committed to Jesus are you? Amen. Will you follow him or will you go away? Well. 
Don't be controlled by your emotions. Don't be controlled by your excitement of the size of the crowd. Don't get lifted up by looking at all the other people. Don't make a quick, unthoughtful decision. But I want you to listen to the Holy Spirit. Trust in God and let the Holy Spirit control you because he will set your heart aflame if you genuinely believe in Jesus Christ's death, burial, and resurrection from the grave. Henceforth, for time's sake, moving on to the second man, in verses 59 and 60, Luke indicate, unlike the first man, the second man was a Christian that Jesus urged to follow me, just as he urges all who believe in him to do the same. Because to some measure, we recognize the tremendous price Jesus paid to redeem us, as well as the high cost it means to be a follower of Jesus Christ. So when urged to follow me, Jesus was saying to the second man, many sincerely believe that I am God and trust me as Savior. But when it comes to being the Lord of their life, they haven't completely surrendered their life to Jesus. In other words, they can't say I am sold out to Jesus. They can't say I am a committed disciple and I'm committed to discipleship training and faithfully committed to coming to Bible study, Sunday school, Baptist training union, morning and evening worship, and the auxiliary meetings of the church to be properly trained or to learn how to grow in the grace and knowledge of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Instead, they are Christians who have become a one Sunday wonder. By now, y'all know what I mean. I hope by one Sunday wonder. And if you don't know, let me go and explain what the meaning is of a one Sunday wonder. One Sunday out of the month, you see me. Then you wonder, when will I see you again? Because of your inconsistency in giving, in attending, and participating in the church. Amen. That's why Jesus who does the leading. Also demand that we consistently follow him. Amen. I should have got a witness from everyone in the church. Amen. Jesus who does the leading. Also demand that we who believe in his death, burial, and resurrection from the grave. Uh -huh. Consistently follow him. Amen. Wherever he leads. And for some, following comes easier because many people follow a friend. Many follow a spouse. And many follow a respected leader. But who is it that you are really following? Who is leading you? Man or God? Power? Prestige? And a position? Or Jesus Christ? Again, who is really leading you? See, some people come to church and you wouldn't even think they know that individual because in the sanctuary they never speak, they never sit by one another, they never seem to have make eye contact, but they know how to speak by their body language. And because they know how to speak by their body language, they have already allowed somebody to lead them. And the way I can tell because that person who sit on one side of the sanctuary to my right uh -huh. and another person who sit on the sanctuary to my left even though they're not by one another that person on the right won't say anything until the person give them permission on the left to do it <laughs> I can tell it y'all know often I've said this and I said it earlier in my preaching today but I say this here to you that I am very limited very shallow and I have limited abilities to work on electronic devices, especially texting and emailing and all those kind of things. I don't really get into that kind of thing. So it used to be at a, there was a time before I came to understand how these new uh, electronic devices called cell phones had Bible apps 
and people would be in the sanctuary using their computer and cell phones to read the scripture texts and taking their sermon notes. But you know what? I'm not too old school to know that somebody is not always using it for the right reason. Because right now while I'm preaching, somebody just texted another person. I heard it go dink. And they said, girl, he tripping up there talking about me. I mean, because who are you following? Who is leading you? Once more, take note in Jesus' statement to the second man who was a born-again believer. He told him to follow me because when bidden to come, we must immediately obey God instead of giving one excuse after another excuse of why we haven't obeyed God. Because when bidden to follow Jesus, notice the second man offered a seemingly acceptable excuse that as a Christian appeared very logical. But yet, remember, he was talking to Jesus. And he said, Lord, meaning the searcher and revealer of all hearts, suffer, which means permit or allow me first. Catch those two words. Allow me first to go and bury my father. For his goal and desire seemed very honorable. It seemed very holy. It seemed very heartfelt and very dignified at first glance, as well as an obligation for all of us to do out of love, respect, concern, and appreciation for our parents' sacrificial service that they have rendered all down through the years in our behalf. But the second man's commitment to the welfare of his ailing father's last stages of life was commendable because he held up the teachings of Leviticus 21, uh -huh. verses 1 through 3, which instruct children of the deceased not to bring the bill of the cost to the church and on other family members and co-workers and friends because of their failure to prepare for death ahead of time. Let me break it down to you where the rubber meets the road. When you have death in your family, we can share one another burdens by praying for one another. We can share about one another burdens by coming to the aid and being there to comfort and speak words of encouragement and to lift one another up. But most of the time, people feel that's a burden that we can share by bringing us your funeral bill. Uh -huh. That's not what the Bible teach. In fact, it's a violation of scripture because Le Leviticus, rather, 21 verse 1 through 3 teach. That's the responsibility of all the children in the house Amen. that you ought to be able to have enough credit. You ought to have enough cash. Amen. You ought to be able to have enough emergency money put aside that when death come to your house that you shouldn't bring that bill to the church. Y'all ain't going to say amen. amen. But I'm going to preach this thing anyway. Uh -huh. In fact, read the Bible. See, remember the Old Testament is the New Testament concealed. And the New Testament is the Old Testament revealed. Amen. Therefore, in 1 Timothy 5 and 8, uh -huh. the Bible speaks of an unbeliever's preparation of his family future. And if we who are saved by the grace of God fail to prepare for our family needs when sickness, death, uh -huh. and other disasters strike, then we are worse than an infidel yes. because we should think about not only the things in time, uh -huh. but also in eternity too. In other words, an unbeliever knows that I'm not going to live forever. So while that unbeliever is in good health, while that unbeliever is making money, that unbeliever first of all goes out and buy him or her some life insurance because they know one day my health will not be able to qualify. And that unbeliever don't waste all of his money spending it on a good time. But that unbeliever start to realize there are some responsibilities. And if you know, that one day you're going to have to stand before God while you're up there shaking it. Why are you shaking it, shaking it, shaking it? 
while you're out there running those streets, while you're doing everything, you put some money aside and you prepare yourself and your family for the future ahead. Therefore, the second man's request was both reasonable and respectful, whether his father was still alive or deceased because children who fail to honor thy father and mother are guilty of also failing to honor God who attach a promise, a blessing in Ephesians 6 and 2 to those who obey his command in this manner. In fact, the second man's response that Jesus could see by the attitude of heart to his father's need is a problem of today, which misunderstand because they assume his father just had died when Jesus told him to follow me. So their assumption is he needed to prepare for the services and lay his father's body to rest 